Hi everybody. A couple of months ago, I thought it'd be pretty funny to do a review of Do Where's My Car once 2024 hits. And apparently, so did almost 30 of you. Including the one and only number one Dude Where's My Car fan, who suggested I click the link in his bio. And by clicking on said link, it leads me to a Google Drive link of the entire movie, so thanks man. So here it is, the fabled Dude Where's My Car review. Enjoy. You guys know the film The Hangover? The movie where a bunch of dudes wake up after a really wacky and drunk night with zero recollection of what happened, with their goal being to find the one dude missing in their group? Well, Dude Where's My Car is similar to that, but instead of finding a dude, they find a car, and everything runs on Looney Tunes logic. Oh, and it was also released nine years earlier. I honestly don't know much about this movie apart from the main leaps themselves. Ashton Kutcher, who was in the 70s show, Damn! and Sean William Scott, who was in the Ice Age movies as Crash. At least, that's where I knew him from. <laughs> Not only that, but Sean thought that dude Where's My Car would get an award at the time of making it. The making the movie, I remember Ashton and I, you know, were like, we got a chance to win some awards for this thing. But what fascinated me the most about the movie, however, is the poster itself. Like, honest to god, this should be hung in a museum to show how the 2000s were like. It's not a positive view of the 2000s, but regardless, you got Ashton Kutcher questioning your mere existence, Sean William Scott looking like he's about to commit several charges on you, two random models that are just there for some reason, and a group of twins that arrived in to, I guess, give the poster some degree of symmetry, and as a cherry on top, the speech bubble that acts as the film's logo. It's perfect. A chef's kiss if I do say so myself. Alright, that's enough about the poster. How's the movie itself? It's bad. I mean, I didn't expect much from a silver comedy, but yeah, it's pretty damn bad. It's honestly kind of hard to describe what the film was like, because it had like five different subplots and the pacing goes at like 200 miles per hour, while also feeling like the film is four hours long. Well, let's just start at the basic premise before I get too ahead of myself. The film tells the story of Jesse and Chester, two sorors who just woke up at what seemed to be a wild party last night with no recollection of what happened. They went outside to realize that, oh no, the car is gone. And by the way, they actually do say the name of the movie like three times in that one scene. Dude, where's my car? So in order to find their car, they had to retrace the steps about what happened last night while also encountering some wacky stuff along the way. Sounds simple enough, right? Well, yeah, no shit it does. But as you'll see later, things get off the rails really quickly. And by later, I mean right now with the opening credits. The opening credits are what I can describe as a foreshadow trip. You had some people in jumpsuits dancing in what I can say is a Final Destination ass background. And then all of a sudden you see ostriches and a 3D model of an anthropomorphic cat dancing. I guess that's what true. The what, what the, the fuck? <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> that CGI like fairy thing like really caught me up guard. <laughs> Same. <laughs> it's like what the hell? Keep those descriptions I mentioned in mind. They'll be important later. The two leads, Jesse and Chester, are alright as a duo. They're the typical dude bro stoner characters that I expect to see in these kinds of movies, but they do have some funny moments. One of the better jokes with them is when Jesse has to instruct Chester to use a fire hydrant to knock two guys out, but Chester is too stupid to read non-verbal cues, so after a while, Jesse just does it himself. Double kill. It doesn't drag out for too long, and the punchline is really funny. What are you, deaf? There's also a scene where the two dudes stumble across a man and a woman that I probably should have recognized. I feel like I should know these people. <laughs> yeah, right? That's what I'm thinking too. And they do a little stare off until the couple starts kissing. Only for the stoner duo to just kiss each other as well. Yes! <laughs> True, I mean, love, let's go! Under the dose scenes are pretty predictable as far as goofy duos go, with a slight hint of charm. You know, one's dumb, the other seems dumber, but it's actually pretty smart sometimes. It's like a lesser version of Lloyd and Harry from Dumb and Dumber, only that Jesse and Chester respect women less. Also, the movie tries so hard to give them a catchphrase, which is shibby for some reason. Shibby! I think it was made up for the movie itself, but that doesn't stop people at psychicchange.com to figure out the linguistics of it. And I don't know why, I just find it really funny. Hi, uh, editor me here. Uh, while on the topic of the catchphrase shibby, uh, apparently Super Mario Logan also uses that, that catchphrase on one of his characters, Jeffy. What, what are you doing with the other hand? Shibby! <laughs> Honestly, this whole movie just felt like it was made to be called Dude Where's My Car, and they just kinda write a story around that concept without putting much thought into it. Every plot point just happens out of nowhere with like zero build up or transition. It just feels like they're speedrunning making a movie. 
To give an example, within the first 10 minutes of the movie, you have a guy walk out of the closet to piss into a plant, the dudes realizing they want a lifetime supply of pudding for some reason, they get scolded by their girlfriends, Wanda and Wilma, about their anniversary gifts while wearing military helmets, cause why not? Then they get scolded again, but this time by their boss at a pizza place for undelivered pizza, as they throw the pizza to the ceiling and eat the slices once the boss leaves. Mmm, ceiling flavor. Mmm, all the cheese is gone. <laughs> <laughs> Just nothing but sauce and asbestos. <laughs> <laughs> and then the plot starts. But not before both dudes get run over by a car, one after the other, all within the span of like 15 seconds. And then you realize, oh wait, you're at the 8 minute mark of this movie. And the easiest way I could describe it, the movie feels both very fast, but also painfully slow. Mostly because of how often the jokes would fly in such a short run time. And the jokes aren't even that good either. They're very hit or miss, and most of the time there's like three types of jokes. Drugs, sex, and goofy random shit. Sometimes a weird mix of the three. <laughs> the most popular bit in the movie is the <laughs> scene in the Chinese restaurant, where Jesse tries to place an order, but the lady in the speaker says, and then. And then? And that's it, that's a joke. Which I guess was written so that Ashton Kutcher could have a meltdown scene, but I felt like it overstayed its welcome a bit. The joke even comes back later in the movie with two other characters. And then? And it even shows up in the blooper reels during the end credits. And then? It's like they're really proud of that joke or something. A little side note, did you know that Seth Rogen and Jake Gyllenhaal auditioned for the main roles in the movie? No source ever specified which characters they were auditioning for, but knowing this fact, it's kind of funny to think of an alternate universe where these two were the main dudes instead of Ashton and Sean. I imagine Seth would be Chester and Jake would be Jesse. <laughs> Going back to the pacing, I feel like the rapid fire pace of the movie kind of works at its benefit, and what I mean by that is that it makes the worst jokes sting less. Like the one where a blind kid touches a woman's breast because, haha, he's blind. No, don't do that. No. no this kid's no, definitely no, like 12. This is how blind people shake hands. I don't think so. No. But at the same time, the pacing is so inconsistent, you can genuinely feel that the movie lost focus like every single time. I watched this movie three times. Three times too many. The first being with my old friend Sean, and we were both just consistently confused at what's going on for the entire movie. Now, may I have a continuum transfunctioner? Not quite yet. Would you consider giving it to me while I continue to give you pleasure? Okay. <laughs> um. Uh, oh, yeah, okay. okay, it was, okay, it was a shame. So. Okay. What? What the fuck happened? <laughs> Why were they stripped out of the clothing? <laughs> In the other two viewings, I showed it to my other friends, and they were just as confused as us. There's just no main focus of this movie whatsoever. It's literally just things happen in the movie, and it's both a blessing and a curse. There's one scene where the girlfriends break up with Jesse and Chester, and they have a moment of reflection which lasts like less than a minute. They just sit down and they're like, man, we're sucky boyfriends. We suck. And Jesse looks at a picture of them for like three seconds and they're like, yo, we can change. We can change. I don't know if it's intentional that this turnaround moment has less time dedicated to it than the entire bit with Christine Boner. Yes, that's her name. Where it ends with boob touching, but it's still pretty funny how inconsistent the pacing is. By the way, there's a music video in this movie for no reason at all. Get shot down cause you're overzealous Play hard to get females get jealous Honestly, I don't know what to make of this And now to go over the most insane plot point in the movie Which makes watching the film even more of a trip I'm of course talking about aliens Yeah, this could count as a sci-fi film, I don't care So after getting kicked out of her girlfriend's home after trashing the entire place For the second time We are so dead They get taken out by a van full of people whose aliens just all begin with the letter Z And Jeff Hey and in the car, they're basically told that they need to cover the Continuum Transfunctioner because they were in possession of that thingy majiggy while they were on their wacky spree. The continuum Transfunctioner is a very mysterious and powerful device. There's like 15 mystery. different like plot yeah, points going on right now. And not only did the two dudes have to do that, they also stumble across some aliens themselves in the form of hot chicks, as state of some state they are. We are not guys, we are hot chicks. And two Nordic dudes, or as I like to call them, female Half-Life Black Ops units, and Ikea. By the way, the whole joke with the Black Ops units is sex. Like, no shit, look what they're wearing. I mean, they're offered for giving them the continuum transfunction as oral pleasure. We will give you erotic pleasure. That means sex. <laughs> the whole continuum transfunction thing slowly switches to become the main focus of the film, as the aliens and the Zoltan cult, yes, that's her name, 
are trying to obtain it for their personal needs. The Nordic guys wanted it because they said that they're the keepers of the device. We are the keepers of the continued transformation. The Black Ops units wanted it to destroy the universe, I think. And the Zoltic cult wanted it to go to space. I think. It's a whole rat race and it makes the movie just a little bit funnier because of how wild it is. At some point, Jesse and Chester get kidnapped by the Sultan cult, and after the fire extinguisher scene, they disguise themselves as members of the cult, where a big meeting is in progress. And this is where we see the great leader Zoltan, Donald Davidport from Lab Rats. Is that Davenport? Who? The guy from fucking Lab Rats? <laughs> I don't know what else to say, it's really funny that Hal Sparks is in this movie, especially with how oddly dedicated he is to his performance. They mocked us when we started wearing bubble wrap jumpsuits, but who's, who's laughing, laughing now? At this point, it just seems like I'm pointing out random stuff in the movie, and yeah, I am. But again, that's also because the movie really is just things happening. Right down to the funny transition that I see in the Bill Nye episode. <laughs> what are oh. these transitions? <laughs> and now we finally get to the climax of the film. Well, not before trying to get help for the weird neighbor, get bullied by extras from Greece, get being berated by a trans stripper whose whole joke is that she has a bulge and a deep voice, ha ha ha, get lured to a dry cleaner shop for special suits, in which Chester finds a Rubik's Cube in, that may or may not be important later, get questioned by the police, find out that their car was impounded and sold to a very suspicious place, want to get chased by ostriches and kidnapped by a French guy to play trivia with a fruity captive, and then after getting a trivia question right, the French guy suddenly turns Italian, this is absolutely correct, and it is given the guy's car keys after his car disappears, which leads into the final spot, the arcade. Then there, the boys give the trans stripper a suitcase as they meet her boyfriend Patty for more haha -ha funny trans jokes, and then the climax happens! Also, I forgot to mention that the girlfriends were also kidnapped by the Zoltan. Yeah, that happens. Yeah, this movie's weird if you haven't picked that up already. So yeah, the climax itself is pretty funny, as literally every character, including the pizza guy from the beginning, all collectively show up for the continuum trans functioner. Because as it turns out, the funny device is sitting under the Rubik's Cube that Chester found all along. Wow, it really is important. Which, not gonna lie, I actually kind of subverted my expectations. And speaking of subverting expectations, every being that shows up in the opening credits did play a part of the movie in some way. Yes, even a CGI nightmare, despite just being the logo for the script club. Can't wait for the video essay analysis on that observation. And that's how Dude Where's My Car from 2000 subverted the audience expectations through the use of foreshadowing. Thanks for watching. Tune in next time where I talk about why Breaking Bad is a television masterpiece. <laughs> What's even crazier is that the fate of the universe is now at stake because all the funny lights blink at the same time. Once all five of the Dirugian crystals stop flashing, the universe is going to be destroyed. It almost makes you forget that they had to find her car. Almost like it was the whole point of the movie or something. And yes, the continuous transfunctioner does somehow connect to the dude's antics last night. Because, as explained by the Nordic dudes, they were taken out of space with him, and when they were dropped off, they forgot the continuum transfunctioner. Uh, long story short, the Nordic dudes were really the keepers of the device all along, and the dudes know that because the Nordics saw their hole in one W, which leads them to having a lifetime supply of pudding. Crazy shit. But wait! The Black Ops units are morphing into one big alien creature! It's morphin' time! Which is... A giant Playboy model. Honest to god, I was disappointed by this. I know it's weird to have some level of expectations for Dude Where's My Car, but I kinda expected it to morph something like a Xenomorph or a Covenant from Halo, but nope. Tall Hut Woman, because the writer wrote the script with one hand in his dick, apparently. Also, War. And lame panty shot joke. I'm more involved that right, Daddy. Me too, son, me too. What the fuck? Uh, <laughs> That's so weird. So how do you defeat the quote-unquote giant hot chick alien? By using the Annihilator Beam, of course. Why is it on the machine, and exactly what power does the actual machine hold? No idea, the movie never explains it. And honestly, I kinda like it that way. It makes the movie even more goofy. By quite literally releasing his inner monkey, Chester using the Annihilation Beam to defeat the giant bitch. Ding dong, the wicked bitch is dead. Now you may be wondering after just going through that Godzilla-ass climax, Dude, where's his car? No idea. Dude, where's my car? He said it again! He said it again! I say no idea, because after defeating the giant alien, Dunorix decided to neuralize the memories, Men in Black style. Not before making a Uranus joke. Have you guys ever been to Uranus? And take them back to the morning where the whole movie started, which is how they found their car. You couldn't make this shit up. Actually, the writer did. So yeah, they found her car and drove to the girlfriend's place to give them their anniversary presents. One of which is some necklace thing given to the dudes by the Nordics, which... 
it does that, yep. And just in case you didn't notice that their boobs grew bigger, here's another close-up shot of them. Thus, the movie ends with the dudes and their girlfriends driving out to celebrate their anniversary. That's... definitely a way to end the movie. It was not a good way, but it definitely was a way. Alright, I may be finished with this movie, but let's talk about the DVD for a second. Because even though I was basically given the movie for free, I decided to buy the DVD for those special features because I have no self-respect as a human being. I mean, come on, it was only seven bucks. I would get the Blu-ray, but there's only one special feature in it, and that's the theatrical trailer for the film, so I'm not taking any chances just to get the movie in HD. One feature that caught my eye is that it has seven extended scenes, and honestly, they're nothing to write home about. All the scenes play almost exactly the same as it was in the final cut, with a few extra lines of dialogue and different shots. There is one that's sort of worth talking about, and it's Extended Shack, which takes place when the dudes get kidnapped by the Zoltan clan. After exiting the shack, the dudes get a funny feeling in their asses and... We had to search you everywhere. Even... down there. Uh, okay, never mind, it's not worth talking about, actually. There's nothing else to mention about the special features, other than the featurette that's only like four and a half minutes long, with enough transition that could give anyone a migraine. Then there's also a music video from fucking Grand Theft Audio called Stupid Ass, and despite the funny ass name combo, the song is just alright. There's also some trailers in the DVD too, and in the music video promo, I was shown scared by the fact that Zebrahead was involved in the movie soundtrack, the same Zebrahead that was involved in making his world from Sonic 06, and even made their own version. The contribution is called Playmate of the Year, and looking at the lyrics, it's a perfect fit for the movie. The song also sounds okay. Wait a minute, Wayne was in the soundtrack too? Yep, that's enough talking about the DVD. So, dude, where my car got a Chinese VCD? I'm sorry, what? Yes, it does, baby. This bootleg's from Malaysia and Pretty Pog Champ. Dude, where's my car? Okay, then. Overall, Dude, Where's My Car is dog shit, obviously. The humor is incredibly outdated, and the overall plot is a mess that would confuse anyone watching it, with the main duo not really doing much to save the film. But honestly, I can't hate it too much. You can very much tell what kind of movie they're making, and they're not trying to do anything beyond just being a silly stoner comedy. The sheer insanity of plot is what makes the film have a bit of ironic enjoyment for me. So yeah, it's terrible, but a funny kind of terrible. Apparently a sequel was planned and written, but is in development hell, and honestly, they should make it. All we need is for 20th Century Fox to acknowledge the first film's existence again. I mean, come on, they have Smosh the Movie listed on their website, but not Dude, Where's My Car? And if the sequel can't be made for whatever reason, then I have another proposition. Dude, Where's My Car in 4K? Look, if Universal can release Howard the Duck in 4K, then surely they have the willpower to release this masterpiece in 4K Ultra HD quality. Anyways, movie sucks, but kind of funny. Okay, bye-bye.